Common Sense, so it's Leva. I'm CEO of Three Lines Publishing, the publisher of the Hip Survival Guide. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with Digital Business Law Group. Joining me today as a co-panelist is David Harlow with the Harlow Group. David is a uh, an attorney, a blogger, a consultant, and a thought leader. Um, David, happy to um, have you on board today. Thank you, Carlos. It's a pleasure to be here. As you know, I work, uh, uh, do a lot of work with HIPAA compliance these days, though I am a um, uh, uh, practice uh, healthcare law sort of uh, across the board with all sorts of uh, healthcare providers, vendors, payers. Uh, the, these days I'm doing, as I said, a ton of work in the HIPAA compliance department with business associates and some covered entities as well. Great. So yes, David is available to help you with uh, anything healthcare related, but definitely um, high tech HIPAA stuff and the, the kinds of things that we're going to be covering today. So here's the agenda. Uh, we're going to uh, review some learning objectives, discuss a little background, talk about risk assessments, go through the vocabulary because it's important really like any foreign thing to learn the lingo. Um, it's incredibly important, actually, because otherwise you'll just get lost in the vocabulary. We'll talk about a methodology that we've developed, adopted from um, a NIST methodology. Um, we'll talk about timing of risk assessments. Obviously, uh, risk assessments are a hot topic uh, right now. You, uh, if you ever get audited, that's certainly one thing that uh, that uh, HHS or OCR is going to ask uh, specifically. With respect to the security rule, obviously, if you need to uh, attest to meaningful use, you're going to have to have done a uh, risk assessment. So um, there you go. It's really a baseline requirement for any HIPAA compliance program. Talk about who's responsible for it, and then throw it open to formal Q&A. Although we we uh, we are generally going to work uh, this webinar like we work the others. We will take questions during the webinar, Martin. When our director of operations will be monitoring the chat session, you can uh, throw questions to him at appropriate times. I'll ask Martin if he's got any questions, or he'll just interrupt. And then David and I uh, both will field the questions, and David may have some questions of his own or just some commentary that uh, he adds as we go. So here's the learning objectives: to provide a foundational understanding of risk assessments under the HIPAA security rule, cover the lingo. Discuss a methodology that's agile, repeatable, and verifiable. And that's important because, because a risk assessment, it, it really is plural, risk assessments. Risk assessment is not a one-time thing. It's not a one-time, it's something that you do one time and then forget about it. In fact, um, you know, you, you, once a year is probably the minimum you should be doing a risk assessment. And that's if nothing changes. But if your operational environment changes, then um, the security rule requires that you do another uh, risk assessment. And operational environments, with the, with the amount of change going on in healthcare today, are changing all the time, right? Mergers and acquisitions, uh, et cetera. Um, we're going to cover the timing and the responsible parties, but the overall objective really is to provide organizational stakeholders with, with a sense of how your HIPAA risk assessments should be conducted now that HIPAA is no longer a paper tiger. And the focus here is there's a lot there's a lot of things in a risk assessment that you can be doing that doesn't really require um, consulting, right? It, 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 there's some common sense things like taking an inventory of all your assets, uh, of your operations, of your uh, the individuals in your workforce. There are things like that that really you can't buy a product to do and you know, once you get your head around the process, you could uh, do a lot of it on your own. So a little bit of background. The, a risk assessment really is, has to cover, uh, even though it's part of the security rule, it's an implementation specification uh, that's part of the security rule. Uh, administrative standards, the first standard, it's got four implementation specifications. The first one is a risk assessment. It really encompasses breach notification and privacy as well. It, it touches all three legs of the High Tech Act uh, container stool, okay? And we'll talk more about that. So it's a, a, a comprehensive look at your program, uh, and these three individual legs really are um, 
are more in, are more tightly integrated than one would suspect. Now, here's our graphic showing that, as with all things HIPAA, you're gonna you're gonna um, get into compliance and build a better compliance story over time. This is not something that you just do once and then forget about it. You're gonna have to iterate because no one uh, is gonna get this thing done in a day or a week or even a month. It's probably if you if you haven't done anything after the High Tech Act, it's probably a three to six month project just to get booted. Now that you know, you get started, um, you get, get gather uh, all the requirements, understand them, do your risk assessment, get your folks trained, uh, and but it's something that you'll continue to work on. So by good story, what we mean is the ability of uh, for your organization to produce visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance over time. All right, and what you want to quickly get out of is the no story land, which if you have no story, that's that's um, when we say no story. That's a metaphor for all you have is that three ring binder. You haven't done anything since the High Tech Act was promulgated five years ago, and you're definitely going to be in willful neglect land if that's if that's all you got. And what you want to do is quickly move to the good story part of the continuum, so that if there was a breach or an audit uh, or a patient complaint and HHS or a court of law happened to intervene and look at your program you could make a good faith argument that you're trying to comply with the law even though you may not be fully compliant. Why is that important? Because making, if you can make a good faith argument um, that you're attempting to comply, you probably won't be hit with willful neglect fines which start at 50000 per violation. So David, would you agree with that sort of strategy? Yes, it's a critical approach, and the key is to understand that this is not a set it and forget it kind of operation. The the compliance approach here is a continual uh, iterative approach, as you said, Carlos. And the even take doing the risk assessment will not yield a to do list that you're going to knock off in a in the course of a week or so. It's going to it's going to yield a a to-do list that is prioritized, and there are some things that will have to be knocked off right away, but there's an understanding that there are certain things that you can't do right away, and you will do over time, and they're not super critical, but they do need to be addressed. Um, so it's really a, a, a compliance process. This is not an event. It's a process. Yes, yeah, exa exactly. And that's a great, that's a great insight there on the nature of a risk assessment because, because when you do your first one, especially if you're using some automated tools for the technical part of an assessment that goes out and looks at your network and and discovers the vulnerabilities, uh, that report alone could come back with thousands of potential vulnerabilities, right, which would be overwhelming. So even within a risk assessment, you, you, you are there's going to be some stuff that you don't do. There's going to have to be some decision making that says, you know what, we're going to attack this 70% and 80%. And that, by the way, is okay, right? There's no, there's no, um, and in fact, that attacking, and we'll get to this too, but that, that attacking of the problem, the actual remediation or, or mitigation of vulnerabilities that you find is really not part of the risk assessment. It's part of risk management as far as the security rule goes. The risk assessment part is really just documenting the threats and vulnerabilities uh, um, that are out there and then making some decisions as to how to move forward. So let's start just by quickly going through some vocabulary. Uh, Martin, I'm going to assume that nobody's got a question at this point. You are correct. Okay. So <clears throat> you guys can read. Um, these, I'm just going to highlight certain terms that, that we're going to use later, um, and so you're familiar with them. So when we say asset, we mean networks, PCs, servers, mobile devices, information systems, buildings. It's it's a um, it's a broad definition of an asset. Attack an attack is any kind of malicious activity. Um, could be man-made, could be uh, nature. Authentication is the verification of a user's identity, which is an important part of um, security rule implementation. And some of some parts of the security rule are really uh, arcane and super complex. Other parts are really 
uh, IT 101. These are things that you should be doing, and a lot of it are things that you probably already are doing. So I, I don't think there's generally a complete green field, although it may, it may be largely a green field with respect to uh, the important stuff. The documentation policy, according to the privacy rule, must be maintained for six years. Okay, this has, this has nothing to do with how long you maintain PHI. In fact, the, the rules um, don't say anything about how long you should maintain PHI, and there are good reasons why you should have a, a, um, a policy with respect to how long you maintain PHI, but this is how long you maintain the documentation of your compliance. So when we talk about visible demonstrable evidence of compliance, we're talking about your policies, your processes, and your tracking of the processes. Right, the documentation with respect to that. For example, let's say you have a training policy. So you have a training policy, you have a training process, and then you, you should be able to uh, track, and uh, or you should be tracking as part of that results. Right, when was so and so trained? What were they trained on? You log the date, and that becomes the visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance with respect to training. That kind of documentation needs to be maintained for uh, six years. Now. Uh, David, are you aware of any sort of state laws that, uh, I'm not aware of any federal law that imposes a date as to how long PHI uh, needs to be kept. Are you aware uh, of any? I was, I was going to interject here that there are a whole host of um, documentation, maintenance, and destruction schedules that any covered entity or business associate would have to have in place not just for HIPAA compliance purposes, but for compliance purposes in general. Um, for some purposes, there's going to be a seven-year uh, retention uh, requirement for certain medical records. Uh, for some institutional providers, there is perhaps a 20-year or a 50-year retention requirement based on state laws. So this is just one piece of a broader web of documentation maintenance requirements. Yeah, and it and it and it's important for lots of different reasons, but it it it, it really it's really important for um, discovery. You know, if you're um, if if you don't have a policy and you've maintained um, you know every record since you started doing business fifty a hundred years ago, uh, not probably not a hundred years ago, but fifty years ago, uh, <laughs> you, you know you. Um, you have to produce that, perhaps, right? If it's available. Uh, uh, That's right. If your if your policy says that you keep these things for fifty years, then you'd better be able to produce them if asked. Right. Um, so, for a variety of reasons, it's important to uh, figure out what your documentation maintenance requirements are outside of HIPAA, and maintain things really for the shortest amount of time that is legitimate for each particular type of record. Now, in this day and age with uh, cheap storage, our default approach seems to be save everything in the cloud forever because storage is cheap and it's more expensive to figure out what do I have to save and for how long. Well, let me suggest that in the long run, it is not going to be cheaper to just keep everything because dollars to donuts, there's going to be some smoking gun in that documentation that you would rather not have hanging around for the long term. That's exactly right. And if you have a policy in place that says that you, you as part of your policy, you destroy PHI, let's say after 15 years, right, and then you, you've destroyed the PHI because it's part of your policy, then you are still okay with respect to uh, not having violated any e-discovery rules. Um, on, on, on the other hand, as David suggested, if you have it available, not only, not only do you have to produce it, you're going to have to pay lawyers to wade through all those documents to see what's uh, discoverable, what's relevant, and what's not privileged. And so even though storage is becoming cheaper, it is not uh, a good idea to keep things forever. Okay, so moving on here, exploitation. When we say exploitation, we mean uh, a specific threat triggering a given vulnerability, and we're going to look at threat vulnerability pairs. Uh, we're going to really uh, dwell on that a little bit because that's how you analyze, and that's how the NIST uh, process recommends that you do this thing. Uh, when we talk about impact, we're talking about the magnitude of harm of a threat 
actually exploiting a given vulnerability, and that magnitude of harm is the magnitude of harm to your business. You know, if this threat exploited this vulnerability, what's going to happen? You know, it could be a fire, it could be, um, you know, it could be a hurricane, it, whatever. You know, and so uh, what's that? What's that going to do to you? And you, you can, you can, uh, as part of this, you document that. You say, well, we would be down for a couple of days, or if we lost, uh, you know, if we lost our EHR system, obviously we'd have to go back to paper, and it would, you know, cause this, that, and the other. And that, that's the kind of Analysis that you uh, that you go through. Uh, integrity is used quite a bit in in the security rule, and it, I think it, I'm not sure. You know, I'm, I'm, I know why they used it, but I think it's it's confusing for lay people. It's uh, guarding against or protecting against the improper EPHI modification or uh, destruction. Which um, yes, sounds like it's an important thing to do, but as as a practical matter, how you get at that and Providing that integrity is through encryption and other means, uh, so it's it's kind of an abstraction. Um, likelihood, uh, as we're going to use it today, is a weighted factor based on subjective analysis of the probability. So there are no when we're talking we're talking about uh, probability and, and, and we're going to talk about calculating risk and all that, but really it's a subjective analysis. We're using these mathematical terms because they're convenient, but we're not going through really any mathematical process, so try to uh, highlight that. Operations are your processes and workflows that interact with e, uh, EPHI, and if, uh, uh, David, why don't you talk a little bit about that tool that you posted about, because I think this is an, uh, it was an important find. Sure. There's um, the data project at Harvard University has been compiling over time a series of uh, um, well, it, it, it is what it says, the, the data map. So there's a, um, uh, and you can find this online at thedatamap.org. Um, there is a, basically a web of relationships between patients, providers, labs, payers, uh, all sorts of business associates, registries, public health services, etc. And there's really this web of data that uh, connects all of these points in the healthcare and uh, public health systems. Many of these parties share data under HIPAA for treatment, payment, and operations. Many share data for public health reporting purposes. And this tool shows what, ser what sorts of data are shared that are identified with patient name on them, what are shared without names, and sort of under what authority those things are shared. And um, it's a useful tool because as you dig through it, you see what are the things that are covered by HIPAA and what are the data flows that are not covered by HIPAA but are still things that we need to think about and, and, be, and be aware of as we're, cons as we're concerned with this sort of exercise. Because yes, the, the risk assessment is relevant to PHI as it's covered by HIPAA, but you know, in the real world, if you tell a patient, well, something got released inappropriately, but it's not covered by HIPAA, so it's not my problem, that's not going to fly. So you need to be aware of uh, other kinds of data, other kinds of releases, other kinds of responsibilities. Right, and, and, and especially as part of a risk assessment where step one really is to do this inventory, and the inventory, you inventory your assets, you inventory your the individuals, your workforce, uh, and you inventory op what we're calling operations, uh, but operations really is just another word for a workflow. And yes, you can give an, a, a workflow a name, you know, it's the clinical workflow, it's the payment workflow, it's, you know, but it, it, it is much uh, more effective as a diagram so that you can visualize what that workflow looks like, what the steps are, uh, how it releases information, and it, it becomes not only a, a great tool to document your workflow for purposes of figuring out which one of these uh, flows is touching EPHI or releasing EPHI, it's also a great way to train your folks so that they become aware of uh, these workflows and how they work. And I, 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 can, um, I can tell you that probably most of the training prior to the High Tech Act, and maybe even a lot today, is still that sort of HIPAA feel-good training that 
uh, didn't go into much depth and really does not um, is not effective anymore for the high tech act staff, clinical staff, uh, the, your nurses, your doctors, your physical therapists, and everybody else just about needs to have a better understanding than what uh, was provided um, heretofore. So risk, obviously, uh, well, let me let me talk about operational controls. So these are the security controls. Uh, Carl, uh, safe. Yes. Uh, just a, a couple quick. Uh, People missed the uh, tool, the the name of the tool that David David uh, you were talking about, and where it could be found. Could you repeat that, please? Sure. It's called the Data Map, and it can be found online at thedatamap.org. T h e d a t a m a p dot org. Uh, this is compiled by uh, a program within Harvard that is actually overseen by a professor who is currently on leave to serve as the chief technology officer of the Food and Drug Administration. So she and her group know their stuff. Great. And uh, by the way, there's a group um, on LinkedIn, the HIPAA Survival Guide group, that David actually posted a link uh, in his blog post uh, regarding the map and there's usually a pretty good conversation going on in that LinkedIn group with a lot of um, different participants weighing in um, answering questions and really just ha having having a conversation about these uh, this changing environment so um, your operational environment that's a term of art it means the physical technical and organizational setting in which an, an information system operates we talked about operational environments changing uh, for lots of reasons um, and I, I can't remember if it was the VA or um, someone had a move where they didn't do another risk assessment they had all these tapes in the closet they got stolen anytime your operational this goes to the question as to when you should do a risk assessment anytime your operational environment changes in a major way and HHS OCR would say that a move is a big deal that's a change in your operational environment obviously then you need to do a risk assessment mergers and acquisitions etc would also qualify now, definition of risk. So, the definition of risk is the net mission impact. Considering, and we're going to go through this this calculation here and more graphically, but considering the probability that a particular threat will exercise, accidentally trigger, or intentionally exploit, really doesn't matter. A specific vulnerability and the resultant impact, and that's going to be impact to your business, to your operations, if this should occur. So that's risk. So a risk assessment really is a process by which an organization identifies the following threats to the organization's vulnerabilities and the harm. Right? That's that's the that's what that's the exercise that you're going through. And then the likelihood that that harm will occur is the risk. Risk management is really more a comprehensive global organizational process and We've done an entire webinar on risk management. It's actually the second implementation specification of uh, the administrative safeguards standard number one, and we'll, and we'll get to that. Uh, and the first step of a risk management program, according to the NIST um, methodology, is to do a risk assessment. So a risk assessment is this continual thing, and uh, you know, I, I, I believe that. Um, HHS split it out this way just to highlight the fact that at least you had to do a baseline risk assessment because um, risk assessment really is part of the, uh, a part of a risk management program. It's the first step in it, and uh, the risk management program uh, I like to say swallows really the entire your entire not only security rule implementation it swallows your entire HIPAA implementation because risk management your risk management program is your compliance program um, that if you just look at the rules there that uh, is not very clear that that's uh, what's going on there risk mitigation is how you respond to the risk risk monitoring is an ongoing awareness in, of an organization's risk environment obviously you have to you you, you, you you have to be monitoring 24 7 these days you, and the only way you can monitor 24 7 is you have some uh, technology agents that are helping you assist you 
assisting you in that monitoring, and then you have people that are reviewing logs and things like that on, on, on a continuous, uh, probably daily basis. Somebody should be looking at various logs. For example, um, you know, talking about things that you can't set and forget. A lot of people, um, a lot of organizations will set and forget their backup plan, and then not realize when the backups are no longer working or that the media became corrupt or so that's an example of a log that you would want to check every day right not not you know uh, uh, physically test every day but look at the error log from the backup and if it if you're running a backup and you're looking at that uh, and I you know I do it right for my small business I do I look at that because I want to know so when I run a backup on, on, on a daily basis and then on a monthly basis I do a full backup, I want to look at that log because if all of a sudden I, I used to have two warnings that I understood, now I have 200, I know I got a problem, I know I need to take some action. So this monitoring is something that you need to do uh, on an ongoing basis. Security controls are the management, operational, and technical controls. And the important part here is that the management and operational controls are as important, if not more important, to your risk assessment than any technical controls that you might implement. Okay, security objects are three things that we've talked about. And these are the three things that you have to inventory. Operations, which we said were data flows, another word for, for, for workflows. Individuals is your workforce and assets. And a technical control is uh, some uh, mechanism contained in hardware, software, or in firmware that's applied to um, an information system, but there are other kinds of controls that we uh, just talked about. And really, we'll, we'll, we'll show you through some examples that almost every uh, standard and requirement of um, the security rule requires could, is, a, is a potential uh, vulnerability if you haven't implemented, if you don't have uh, strong passwords, uh, etc., etc. These are controls that you should be applying to um, these standards. So what's a threat? The threat is the potential for a person or thing to exercise, accidentally trigger, or intentionally exploit a specific vulnerability. There's natural threats, human threats, environmental threats, and so forth. Threat landscape is um, a term that means uh, really it's, it's an abstraction of the threats that exist to your operational environment today that are out there in the wild that you don't, are, are probably not even aware of. And it, it, vendors are becoming fairly sophisticated now in their ability to track the threat landscape, and that's all some vendors do, and they, and they pr provide that or they, they take that threat landscape database and work with, um, other network software that can access that database in order to show at this point in time what are the principal threats that would attack your environment given how you are set up. So that's the level of sophistication that uh, monitoring is going on today. And those threat databases or that threat landscape is updated on a daily basis. And you could make an argument, and I think, uh, I think 10 years from now, it, it won't be such a foreign concept that, that you'll be doing a continual risk assessment, virtual risk, risk assessment every day over time because that's how you're going to be monitoring uh, the threat landscape. And again, the only way to, to manage that is by agents that are doing it for you. But that capability is available uh, today. Vulnerability is a flaw or weakness in the system, security procedures, design, implementation, etc., or internal controls that could be exploited. So Martin, any questions? So we, we skim that. We're going to go, uh, we're going to use these terms, but any questions now? Not at this point. You guys are spellbinding. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Okay, so here's the methodology. Again, we borrowed this methodology from NIST and adopted it. But first, what are, what are we trying to do here? I mean, what what's, you know, it, it's often important to understand what the public policy rationale is of a given set of uh, regulations other than, you know, to, to um, just be a pain in the butt. So as a practical matter, we're trying to Katrina-proof your practice. You know, the, um, 
doing risk mitigation, risk analysis, having a disaster recovery plan, a business continuity plan, having strong passwords, is so that you can have a functional, a, a, a continuously functioning environment and something like Katrina is not going to completely knock you out of um, business and if it does knock you out of business, hopefully it doesn't knock you out of business for months, uh, it knocks you out of business for days and as you know, some huge percentage, 60 or 70 percent of medical offices, of, doc, uh, of legal offices lost everything during Katrina and really it didn't have to be that way, right? With backup strategies and the cloud, and, and these things existed back then, but they weren't widely used. And they exist today, and they're not as widely used as they should be. But as a practical matter, this is, this is you know, kind of what we're trying to do. So if you're selling this concept to your boss, there's some things that you ought to be doing that are really IT 101 that should be doing regardless of HIPAA, okay? Now, from a legal liability and regulatory perspective, what we're trying to do is reduce risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. And I like to call reasonable and appropriate, and that's a term that's used throughout the security rule, I like to call reasonable and appropriate uh, legal weasel words. Because if people, if someone asks what does that mean, then you're going to get the standard legal answer, which is, well, it depends. or what does it mean? It means whatever a court of law or a HHS wants it to mean with this, within the, this particular set of facts. Okay, but that's the, that's the bad news. The good news is you can, use, you can also use these same weasel words to, to make a good faith argument that you did, in fact, do what you thought was reasonable and appropriate at the time for an organization of your size, resources, or set, et cetera, even though it turned out that, you know, maybe it wasn't everything you should have been doing, right? So what you want to be able to do is to move to that good story part of the continuum so that you can make an argument that what you did was reasonable and appropriate. Now, I'll give you an example, and I'll, I'll have uh, David weigh in here. For example, encryption is not... Um, a required implementation specification in the security rule. It's addressable, but a court might find, given in this day and age, that uh, if you didn't encrypt, it maybe would find that it wasn't reasonable and appropriate not to have done so. Okay, given the cost of the technology, the available solutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so. Uh, David, you want to weigh in here on, on your view on the weasel words? Yeah, I mean, this, the point here is that everyone listening to this call is likely to experience a data breach at some point. Your organization is more likely than not to experience a data breach. The question is, what then? What do you do once that has happened? Um, you need to be able to explain yourself and you need to be able to explain yourself in a way that's rational, that's connected to the rules, and that's connected to the size and nature of your operation. So you're supposed to reduce risks to levels that are reasonable and appropriate based on the size and nature of your operation. We're not all running um, the Department of Defense. We're not all IBMs. We can't uh, function at that level uh, and devote those levels of resources to security and privacy. So the point is that we're going to do something that's, that's going to be right for us, um, and we need to document it. So if it's documented appropriately, then we have something to hang our hat on if we're put in a position where we need to defend what we've done in the event of a breach or in the event of a complaint or an audit, et cetera. Uh, so it's, it's something that's going to be relevant to the size and nature of your operation. Uh, but the key is that once you make a choice about doing something, you have to be, it has to be rational and you need to document it. Encryption is an interesting example because it's not required under the rules, but it is required under many state rules, state privacy laws. Uh, in my 
home state of Massachusetts, for example, there is a um, privacy law that requires encryption for any personal information. Uh, and the threshold for being considered personal information is, is lower than uh, the threshold for being considered PHI under HIPAA. Uh, so pretty much everything here is where I am is supposed to be encrypted. So it's sort of a non-starter to say, well, I didn't encrypt because it's not required under HIPAA. Yeah, that's that's a that's a fantastic point. On, 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 there's a lot there in what David said. First of all, just the implication of state law, uh, and any state law that's more stringent than HIPAA is obviously not preempted by federal law uh, because it's more stringent, and that's built into the regulations, and that's part of uh, the supremacy clause of the United States. So, uh, and the states know what they're doing, so they're going to make their laws more stringent so that they, they're, they're not preempted and, and they're in effect. Uh, the other part where you're going to see this reasonable and appropriate is even though still under the High Tech Act, an individual doesn't have a right to bring a cause of action uh, under HIPAA. So an individual patient can't bring, a person can't bring a lawsuit. Uh, now the State Attorney General, the State Attorney General can bring one on behalf of, of uh, his or her citizens but here's the thing, and here's where reasonable and appropriate really plays. There's nothing stopping a class action lawsuit being brought under a theory of negligence uh, under state law when there's a bad breach. And I guarantee you that anytime there's a bad breach, you're going to have a class action lawsuit. And this reasonable and appropriate is what they're going to argue that you didn't do, and therefore you didn't meet the standard, and therefore you were negligent. Okay, so for a million and one reasons, we can take encryption and say, you know what, it's just a no-brainer. You should be doing that. And if you're not doing that, um, you know, you're going to get killed either from the state, class action lawsuit, even and maybe even OCR. So, anyway. yeah, and we've seen that in cases in states that have strong privacy laws. For example, California, there was a significant HIPAA. Uh, breach, uh, Sutter Health, Northern California, and that was followed up with the class action lawsuit. And these guys, the class action uh, bar, they're out there. Uh, that's what they do. They're geared up to do this kind of stuff, and they're gonna and, and they're gonna be bringing these suits. So, um, uh, a, a, an audit from HHS may not be the worst you have to fear. Now, just a little bit on what we're talking about here, and we're gonna hit hit on this more. We hit on it early is process, process, process. As David said, this is not an event. And most technology projects fail because of people and process challenges uh, that have very little to do with the underlying technologies and the complexity of those technologies. In fact, the technology, the te enabling technologies to do this stuff right is becoming better and cheaper. Right? Uh, Moore's Law, uh, that's, not the, that's not the challenge here. The challenge is an organizational challenge. So for example, a security rule implementation is more aptly described as a change project, and learning how to conduct effective risk assessments is a big part of that change. And when we mean change, we mean organizational change, the way you think about compliance. That's what has to change. It's not, um, you know, obviously it's just not putting up these HIPAA posters that, and, and having a notice of privacy practices that people used to have before the High Tech Act, which was okay. And the only reason it was okay is because HIPAA was never enforced. Okay, so it really it was never, your programs were never vetted. It was that nobody ever tested them. Uh, so, you know, from our perspective, what you need is an agile methodology to, um, to deal with this organizational process. And what, so what is agile? We're just going to quickly go through this. Agile is a group of methods based on an iterative incremental approach, evolutionary, evolutionary development and implementation, and it acknowledges that due to, a, due to the changing te technical and regulatory environment, the implementation cycle never ends, right? And so you got to get started. Do something, you know, like the old adage, do something even if it's wrong. And I guarantee you there are no perfect risk assessments. So the best thing you can do for risk assessment is get started, figure out what you don't know, do one, all right, and then get continually better at doing the next one and the next one. That's how you're going to get better, and that's actually how you're going to understand the problem. It's not something that you can really just study to death. And, and say, oh, I, I got it figured out now. It doesn't really work that way. So, Tom Peters, uh, author in Search of Excellence, and 
20 other good books, came up with this fail forward fast before Agile was even a cool thing. And what it means is go ahead and make some mistakes. Go ahead and get started so you can figure out what you're doing. And for the healthcare industry, there's really a cultural bias against Agile or something like fail forward fast because for obvious reasons, the, the you know, medicine is based on science, right? There's so much uh, around the, the, the scientific method and, and, and so something like don't study something to death is anathema to the industry. It's not how the industry thinks, right? The industry believes, yeah, if we can just study it long enough, we'll get the right answer. And really, for this kind of uh, problem, a compliance problem, that's not the way you should go about it. Get started and put something in place and then improve it over time. So why fail forward fast? Because it's the only way to attack a wicked problem. And I guarantee you that your uh, HIPAA compliance in initiative is wicked. And by wicked here, we mean hard to solve, not necessarily evil, although a lot of people probably think it's evil as well. But here's some char characteristics as to what the challenge is, is. You don't really understand the problem until you've started developing the solution. I guarantee you that you don't really understand what a risk assessment is until you started to do one. You, 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 and it's going to be overwhelming, and you're going to struggle with how do I get through this. You know, as David mentioned, there's some stuff you're not going to be able to do. How do I respond to these thousands of vulnerabilities that I've identified? And that, there's no, you know, there's no algorithm that's going to solve that for you. That's a business problem. And until you start dealing with it, you're not really going to understand. There's no stopping rule. Like, you know, so there, since there's no definitive problem, there can't be any definitive solution. So that your solution that you come up with for your risk assessment, your risk management program, is not right or wrong. It's just better than others, worse, or good enough, right? Subjective. Every wicked problem is unique and novel. Every, every risk management program, every compliance initiative is going to be unique to your organization because every organization is different, uh, different uh, dealing with different data, different business associates. Uh, different organizational culture, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, therein lies the problem of compliance. It's it's a wicked problem, and it's wicked not because of technology challenges, but because of organizational challenges. So here's our methodology. We're really not talking about methodology uh, specifically in this webinar, other than you can't really talk about risk assessments without introducing the concept, because um, as David said, it's an, it's not an event, it's a process. So assess, simplify, protect, monitor, report. This is a uh, simplification of the NIST risk management uh, framework. I think they have six steps. We have five here. But these are repeatable steps that you're going to be doing. These would be the steps that you would use to implement your risk management program. And assess is exactly what we're talking about today, a risk assessment. And then you simplify what you gathered from that risk assessment because you're not really mitigating in the risk assessment. All you're doing is analyzing and documenting. You simplify because you can't deal with the entire uh, threat landscape on, in one pass. You protect what you can, you monitor, you report, and then you do it again. So it turns out that big problems like a HIPAA compliance initiative requires small solutions, and it's not really that the ultimate so the ultimate solution is going to be small or trivial. Is that the ultimate solution is going to be built upon a set of smaller solutions that you put in place? And and, and David, would you agree that that's the process that you you try to walk through with your clients? Right. There's going to be. The, for any sort of red light or yellow light that you know, we sort of metaphorically have at the end of our risk assessment, there are a number of inputs to that, uh, to each of those red lights or yellow lights. And you need to knock off one piece at a time. Um, again, as, as uh, Carlos said, you don't know how to fix the problem until you start looking at the problem. And it's not one big problem, and that's maybe what why why the sort of human nature, why we don't delve into big problems, because we feel we fear that the solution is going to be really big. But it really isn't. It's a collection of small solutions. And so you have to look at it, figure out which are the small pieces of the solution that you need to implement in order to address the larger problems. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great point because that, that fear is what David is getting at, the fear that the complexity of the problem is so overwhelming that you don't 
you just don't know where to start because you think that you, 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 you conjure up an image that the solution to this overwhelming problem is also going to be overwhelming. And it turns out that if you're going to make any progress at all, the solution to that overwhelming problem is going to be lots of small solutions. And you can get your mind around a small solution, do that, and then move on to the next small solution. And that's what, that's what we mean by getting a better compliance story, right? A, a, a little bit at a time, incrementally better. And that's how you're going to arrive at a, a, a solution that gets better and better over time. And you can look at, you can look at full compliance. I mean, HHS is never going to say this, but there's probably no organization on the planet that's in full compliance. It's, it's kind of an aspirational goal. Uh, an auditor is going to walk in, and any good auditor is always going to be able to find something. But perfection is not the objective here. Right? We're not looking at perfection. We're looking at have you done something that's reasonable and appropriate. Um, we have one question at this point for the both of you. Are there any concerns about security and cloud storage? David, you want to start? Yes. <laughs> well, that's, that's a great yeah. That's the great answer. See, I got a good friend of mine. That does so I mean, we have we we have uh, in any situation where we're dealing with a contractor, where we're laying off some part of the risk and responsibility, um, we're also buying the responsibility for that for that other party's actions. So in order to use a cloud hosting service, you want to be sure that they're up to snuff and they understand HIPAA. There are some cloud hosts that are uh, offering um, HIPAA specific, HIPAA compliant specific services to the healthcare community. And they're the other sort of what I'll call um, um, commodity cloud services that are offering their services directly and they're offering to sign uh, business associate agreements as well. So uh, there's certainly ways in which you can incorporate cloud hosting to a HIPAA compliant approach. Uh, if you're using one of the commodity providers, and I'm thinking about like Amazon or Google, uh, they will they will sign a standard business associate agreement with you if you're a covered entity. If you are a business associate, then they're signing that agreement with you and they're sort of a downstream contractor, but they're bound in to the compliance requirements. Um, and, and that's fine, and there's no reason to doubt that they're any less capable than others of providing the necessary level of uh, privacy and security infrastructure. But remember that what they're providing is just that, it's infrastructure. Uh, so it's not it's not a total solution to a HIPAA compliance problem. Uh, yeah, there are other right. elements to a compliance program beyond picking a compliant cloud host. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point, David. Because uh, I think a lot of people get confused, and the vendors, uh, because they're trying to sell their offerings, confuse the marketplace by you know your EHR vendor may that's hosted on the cloud may say yeah oh, don't worry about it we got it covered we we we've taken care of your HIPAA issues and you know they, first of all there are no HIPAA compliant products there's only HIPAA compliant organizations right business associates and covered entities so somebody saying they're selling a HIPAA compliant product you know that's really a, it's market it's marketing speak what they are selling is HIPAA compliant products and services that uh, that uh, not HIPAA compliant, products and services that help you, the covered entity or the business associate, comply with HIPAA because they address certain parts of, of the regulations. Now, uh, as David mentioned, the big three, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, uh, and when Microsoft actually took the lead in 2011, all now will enter into business associate agreements with either a covered entity or a business associate uh, because it's because the healthcare is a multi-billion uh, you know, it's the next $100 billion IT market, and they weren't going to be able to play unless they did so. So they all, they all have now come around. But, even, right, even but keep in mind, just to interrupt for a sec, sure. keep in mind that for years they, they refused to sign business associate agreements. So beware of the fact that to a certain extent, now that the government said, if you don't have a signed agreement, we're going to read one in 
for you for, out of our regs. So these companies and others say, oh, well, we are going to sign business associate agreements and here's our form. So you've got to believe that those forms are more protective of those companies. So uh, when you enter into them, you need to be you need to read them carefully and understand what you're getting into. You're right. It's it's, it's definitely a, a a buyer a buyer beware um, environment. And here's the here's the other thing, just in general, because this we we could have an entire webinar and probably should go back. And we've done some on the cloud, but the. There are really there. Are, first of all, healthcare is moving to the cloud in a big way for the same reason everybody else is because the economics are compelling, and and, and healthcare is going to continue to move to the cloud for that reason, right? It's like you know, in the early 20th century, there were factories that produced their own electricity until the providers got so good at producing cheap electricity that it didn't make sense anymore. So that's sort of the, what, what, what's going on from an economics perspective, but. The problem is, let me give you this scenario that no vendor is ever going to talk to you about. About, and you know, I have a friend that says, uh, you know what? Sometimes it rains on the cloud, and sometimes there's thunderstorms, and sometimes you get hit by lightning. So you have an EHR vendor that is not only providing the application but storing your PHI. Okay, what happens if you want to switch vendors? What you you better have a a you better have something contractually in addition to your business associate agreement that says that they will provide you the data in some meaningful way that you could read so that you could take and import that data into somebody else's EHR. But it gets worse. What if they go out of business, right? And not, not only do you need the data in the case of a, a software as a service hosted cloud EHR, you actually need the application to be able to read the data to have any shot in hell of moving to some other EHR system. Not, not that you were planning, obviously, on moving to some other EHR system. Nobody plans on that, but thing, bad things happen. And if you don't take into consideration those things from a contractual perspective, you're just out of luck. Good luck trying to get your EHR system up and running if, if your favorite EHR vendor just went bankrupt. Right? And so, you know, there are things like, you should have the vendor put their application and every major release in escrow so that the users could actually get at it if they had to, if something really bad happened. So there are lots of underlying things in the cloud uh, that are contractual in nature that nobody ever thinks about. Everybody thinks about and, not, and they should be thinking about the security aspects. I guarantee you that the contractual uh, aspects are just kind of going by the wayside right now until you hear the horror story, you know, that, that uh, and everybody says, oh, my God, we, we, we have the same sort of problem. All right, with that, we're going to get into the, the, the meat of it right now, um, although really, you know, what we've been talking about, the soft stuff is the hard stuff, so I, all this process stuff is important. Martin, is, are there any questions now? Yes. Is the expectation that an attorney's in, an attorney's in a BA SC relationship sign a BAA? I don't. I don't understand the question. What? what is, David, do you understand the question? In a BA, uh, well, a, um, a, a an attorney could be a business associate in certain circumstances, and you would want to have an attorney sign a business associate agreement in those circumstances. If I, as an attorney, have access to patient data to PHI, then I'm a business associate or a downstream contractor, same as anybody else would be. I have certain obligations of confidentiality as an attorney, but in HIPAA world, I would also uh, be signing a business associate agreement. Yeah, and it goes further than that, actually, if that was the nature of the question, is, is now statutorily business associates have to comply with the security rule and the privacy rule and the breach notification rule, that means that an attorney really should have their own policies in place, their own documentation in place. It is a, 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 a severe burden. Now, it's not just because, it's not, now the relationship is not created just because you're the attorney for a covered entity or you're the attorney for a business associate that looks at uh, PHI. Uh, I mean, that just does work for these entities. You have to actually be uh, looking at protected health information as part of what you do for that entity, and as soon as you do that, then a business associate agreement 
comes into being by operation of law. So you don't, you don't, you know, this is a, a question that uh, confuses people. That that rela that business relationship or that relationship of being a business associate doesn't require an agreement. The re the regs require an agreement, right? But it, it, that it, the existence of the relationships kind of, it, it, it is becomes operational by the law. Okay, as soon as a business partner starts looking at PHI on your behalf, that relationship exists. I'm I'm not sure if we answered the question or not, Martin. But yes, that was that was the basis of the question. Okay. Is there anything else? Not now. Okay, so what we're looking at here, 164.308A1, and uh, in the PDF file, you can click on these URLs and go out to the HIPAA Survival Guide and get the full text. So anytime you hover over, uh, that is uh, the administrative safeguards, the first standard, uh, and it says uh, that this standard requires that an organization implement policies and procedures to prevent, detect, contain, and correct security violations. I got to tell you these and it has four implementation specifications associated with that standard and that's how the security rule works. You have a standard and then you have implementation specifications some of which are addressable some of which are required. Okay, This is the gorilla here that we're going to be talking about. This, this swallows the rule. So the first implementation specification under that standard is the risk assessment and it's required. Okay, and this implementation specification re requires that an organization conduct an accurate and thorough assessment of the potential risk and vulnerabilities to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of EPHI held by the covered entity or a business associate. Okay, that's implementation sp specification one of the first standard. Now, here are the other three. Risk management is also required. A sanction policy is required. An activity review of your information systems is required. Now the third and fourth ones are really no-brainers. Those are really things you ought to be doing. But the risk management implementation specification, the first step of that is a risk assessment. So that's what I mean is that the risk management, you can look at it as this specification being the, your entire program. It swallows everything. And by everything, let me just qualify. Uh, it, it, what, what it would swallow is, and this is the way we approach it, are all the requirements of the privacy rule, all the requirements of the security rule, and all the requirements of the breach notification rule. And OCR has released an audit protocol, and I've uh, next month's presentation is actually going to deal with, with uh, the OCR audit protocols and uh, what it takes to launch a program, but there's 169 requirements that OCR has come up with and actually they're probably we can probably and we do in our checklist consolidate them into fewer but that's what your risk management program has to address so almost the heart of the security rule is in this these first two implementation specifications I would say something like 85 percent but David would you agree right because it really as you said it, it includes the whole in order to do to, to check these off, you're really checking off everything in the rule. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so here are the steps of a risk assessment. We're going to go through the steps one at a time at a high level and, and, and take a first pass at them, and then we're going to come back and look at each step in a more detailed uh, way uh, to sort of get into it. So step one in a risk assessment is to gather data in order to document what we call your as-is operational environment. That's just consultant speak for it's the way it exists today. That's what you. That's what you. What's the baseline, right? And and what specifically you're looking at is operations, which are data flows, assets, and individuals. It's an inventorying process. So you don't need an HIT consultant to do this inventory. You don't need a lawyer to do this inventory. You could start today to go gather this kind of inventory information because if you don't have it you can't go you can't go to step two nothing else makes sense so that's step one step two is gather threats and vulnerabilities or T's and V's that pertain to your operational environment which you will subsequently associate with security objects and security objects um, are assets operations and individuals so 
Many threats and vulnerabilities are common to practices of all sizes, and there's really no need to reinvent the wheel, but here's where some enabling software really helps, at least for the technical part of the threats and vulnerabilities that are out there, without some software that you're running, some network scanning software, some uh, monitoring software that will automatically report these technical threats and vulnerabilities, you probably, um, you know, you, you're probably not going to get anywhere close to where you need to be. And although um, HHS and OCR say that you don't need to spend any money on uh, these enabling technologies, um, that's really total BS because the, without spending some money, you're never going to get to be able to do this in any reasonable and appropriate way. Now, there are solutions, they're becoming cheaper, there's actually some free solutions out there that will, that aren't bad, open source, that will scan your uh, environment, but, you know, they, you know the free is, um, you know, your definition of free uh, may not be my definition, because free comes without documentation, comes with, you know, maybe a six-month learning curve, or, or whatever, right? But for step two, where you're actually going to get to identify threats and vulnerabilities that are technical in nature, you're really going to have to uh, have some enabling software that helps you do that. Now, there are lots of threats and vulnerabilities that are process organizational in nature that you don't need um, technology for that. Okay, Martin, any, any questions? No. I'm going to throw out a number, and this is this is my number. I, I don't. This is not David's number. We didn't talk about this, and this is really covered in our next uh, free monthly newsletter because I think it's important to have an uh, honest conversation with the marketplace. And HHS, first of all, their estimates for implementing this stuff are understated wildly, and and they never and they're never going to come out and tell you that you know you need some of this other stuff, right? So. For a small to medium-sized practice, you're probably looking at, depending on where you're at, depending on the sophistication of your environment, I would say anywhere from um, 7,500 to 15,000 is what you might spend on launching a program, right? Now, and I'm going to throw that out there, uh, and that includes some enabling software, some legal consultant, some HIT consultant. I'll just throw that out there to David and say, you know, David, you want to comment on? And I just made this up, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of putting them on the spot. But <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> no, I think that's I think that's a, a reasonable range for a floor for uh, an organization that is otherwise pretty well set up. Yeah, yeah, it's not right. Exactly, you know, it's not. Um, and and what David says, it's the floor. It could be it, it could be uh, significantly more. So it's not zero. It's not. Five hundred dollars. It's some, you know, amount of money that, and we're going to even a small or mid-sized uh, organization is going to have to cough up to to get this stuff right. Step three in a risk assessment. And now, just so you know, these steps were were borrowed from the NIST framework for doing a risk assessment. Okay, uh, and you know, like everybody else, we love NIST as a reference. But what NIST doesn't do is NIST doesn't give you this is still descriptive and not prescriptive. So for every requirement, they give you 20 questions that you should ask. And if you read those documents, you're like, wait a minute, I wanted answers. Now you give me 20 questions, I want to pull my hair out. I'm looking for, tell me what to do. So the NIST documents uh, don't do that, and they're never going to do that. And HHS is never going to tell you what to do because, you know, then they would say, then you could make the argument, well, we did just like you told us, and now you're saying we're not in compliance. So that's the... Uh, the real challenge when you dig into this stuff is, okay, so what do I actually do to meet this requirement? Step three, so we're giving you, uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today, is things that you actually do uh, from how do you go about doing a risk assessment. But step three, and remember, we're going to cover these steps in more detail on the second pass, is assess your current security controls and minimize, eliminate risk to EPHI based on well-functioning security controls that you already have in place. So if you're already using strong passwords and you've got this new application, make sure the new application is using strong passwords. If you're already doing automatic log off, make sure that the new stuff you know, that you have is doing automatic log off. Look at your current as-is environment for what is working for you from a security control perspective and apply that. That's kind of a baseline uh, starting point. And obviously, the step three your baseline is going to change over time because you're going to be adding more controls every time you do a risk assessment iteration. Now remember, 
I just want to stress this. The risk assessment is not the doing part. It's the analysis part. The mitigation, the actually fixing part, comes in the next implementation specification. So this is a documentation, essentially a documentation exercise. All the more reason that you should get started even if you don't have scanning software. Do it without it and identify what you can because at least you've gotten started and you're starting to learn about the problem. Okay, step four is determine the likelihood that a specific threat will exploit a particular vulnerability. Remember that we're dealing in threat vulnerability pairs and assign some subjective probability value, high, medium, or low. Okay, if, uh, you know, for example, if you don't have a redundant internet connection, um, what's the probability of uh, losing the connection, right? That, and that, that that's going to bring down um, your system. Well, I, I would say, you know, probably medium or high, certainly not low, because it's going to happen. We all lose our connections from time to time, yes. We're all used to a, a high availability environment because the vendors have gotten better and better, but sooner or later, you're going to drop, and if, you, uh, if you're like the rest of the world, if you don't have a redundant connection, you're dead, right? If your EHR system is hosted on the cloud and you just lost your connection and you don't have a redundant connection, well, you know, then you're, you're, uh, you're not going to be able to access your, your medical records. Um, so whether you know you, you you're going to assign a likelihood, a probability that the threat will actually exploit its corresponding vulnerability, and then step five is you're going to calculate the impact of that exploitation on your organization. It really the impact is the magnitude of harm that it's going to cost you. It can be economic, reputational loss, etc. Step six is determine the level of risk associated with the threat vulnerability pair. And risk is calculated, in quotes, because it's really not mathematical, calculated as a function of the probability of a threat exploiting, exploiting a specific vulnerability, okay, the probability of that happening, high, medium, or low, and the impact that that exploitation is likely to have on your operations. Turns out that for impact, for the impact measure, we're also going to use high, medium, and low, and for the risk we're going to use high, medium, and low. So this is a purely subjective exercise, and that's one of the reasons why it's a wicked problem is because there are no fixed answers. There are no bright lines here. You just have to go through the exercise and make the necessary calls. And step seven is to document new modified security controls based on what you found that will help mitigate the risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate for your organization. And again, this step only includes identification of the security controls. It's the next implementation specification that you actually implement the controls to mitigate or remediate what you found. So those are the seven steps at a high level. Uh, Martin, are there any questions? Yeah. On those? Um, we have a county that has multiple departments that maintain PHI. Two of the, part, the departments have separate, totally unconnected EHR EMRs. Should our IT department do the risk assessment for the whole county, or should the departments who have EHR EMRs do their own in addition to the county IT department? You know, that. I mean, the answer to that is really going to be, that's a political, that's an example, that's a, a great example of why it's an organizational problem. I mean, who knows what the answer is to that, right? Because it's, it's just going to depend on the politics, the relationships between the organizations. The rules aren't going to, don't care whether it's your IT, and, you know, that does it or somebody else. If the, if the other um, three or two hire somebody else to do it, uh, you know, I, I think if, if, if there's a, an IT department that has, strong expertise in this space, it would seem like it would make business sense for the IT department to do it for all three uh, organizations. David, what, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, if, if there's a central resource that can do the assessment, it sounds like there's at least two independent systems that need to be assessed. 
uh, and, and if there's a if there's a central resource that can help with that, that could be good. Um, or if there's specialized resources at the individual county provider level, it sounds like there might be two hospitals um, or something like that, where there are two EHR systems. Um, uh, you know, the other the other question is whether it makes sense to consolidate any of those operations. And maybe raising a question like this is an opportunity to consolidate some operations in a way that might be more cost effective. Yeah, you could use it as, as an opportunity to actually start the conversation as to what what would be a, a reasonable way forward. Uh, Martin, anything else? Not at this time. Okay, so we're going to go through the same seven steps, except we're going to just look at it in more detail now. Okay, so step one we said was inventory. These are the things that you're going to inventory, your operations, business processes, and workflows that interact with EPHI on a day-to-day -day basis, or data flows. This brings us back to the conversation we had at the, at the start of the, the webinar. Uh, assets, right, uh, PCs, servers, networks, phones, things like that, that access, store, maintain PHI, and your workforce. Because controls are applied to all three of these, what we call security objects. Okay, and so you, you need to do this inventory, and this is what you're inventorying. So, you know, uh, now HHS or OCR, I'm going I'm to use those terms synonymously, but they're really not synonymous, but, you know, HHS, o OCR just released a, uh, what they called a handy risk assessment tool, and I, I, I got to tell you that it was so handy that I spent about 15 minutes and I couldn't figure out what the, what the tool was, uh, but it was purportedly to help you do some of this inventory stuff. Uh, Martin actually did spend some time uh, going through the entire thing, and Martin, what, I mean, how useful did you find it for uh, helping you do an inventory? Um, not very useful for an inventory, but useful for creating a list for HHS. <laughs> well, Martin's a conspiracy theorist. So yes, I am. To, we don't want to go there, <laughs> man. That's, uh, that's off topic, man. We don't want to go down that okay. rabbit hole, man. All right. So anyway, look, you don't need anything special for an inventory. You don't need a, a database, even an access database. You can use a spreadsheet. This is what we're showing. This is what we. This is one of the tools that we uh, sell as part of our security rule checklist. Uh, we also uh, provide these tools that you're seeing today in our risk assessment training. So if you go through the training, uh, you can you can also have available uh, access to these tools, and they're really just some spreadsheets that we put together as to, sh to show you how to go about creating an inventory. Here we're looking at uh, assets: PCs, mobile phones, laptops, tablets. Uh, we're looking at software, databases, operating systems, you know, other applications, and, you know, <clears throat> assigning a, a unique identifier uh, to them, um, and so forth, right? It's not, it's not rocket science, whether or not they're encrypted. It turns out that this becomes, once you have this inventory, there's lots of things that you can apply, lots of information that you can apply to the selected object, like, for example, for this security object, Right? What are the security controls that we already have in place? Right? So you begin to get your mind around how you actually do this from a, a, a practical matter. Uh, here we have plant equipment. They're part of your assets. Rooms, entrances. Th these are all things that need to be uh, dot captured so that then you can see if you have the right administrative, physical, and technical controls in place to do what? To reduce risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. So. You know, as you can see, really, a, a, a lawyer or a consultant is not going to be that much help in gathering your inventory. Uh, now, there are there is enabling software out there that will inventory every asset that you have on your network, and that's helpful, right? So that's helpful, and you probably want to be, use something like that for that part of the inventory. But you know, for something like your workforce. You know, you're just going to have to document it. You know, the, the name, the date hired, the date terminated, the last time they trained, whatever information you need to uh, include or you want to include. Now, we, you know, we're giving you a starter set of tools to help build this inventory that you can modify. You can add columns, delete columns, make it work for you. But the bottom line is you can't really go much further until you do the inventory. 
Okay, and here are the workflows. Yes, you can name the workflow and you can give it a description, uh, and you should, but you should also create uh, a data flow diagram using Visio or you can even use PowerPoint or any number of tools, and you can use that uh, data map that David talked about as the universe because your, your workflows are going to be some subset of that because that looked like it was documenting almost every possible way that EPHI could be used in, in the current environment that we have. And David, would you agree that's sort of like the, the 100,000 foot view, right? That captures, exactly. right. That captures all, every workflow possible. And so your workflows are going to be some subset of that. Uh, and again, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. There's tools out there that you can use. So, okay, so step one was do this inventory. Step two, what are the kinds of threats out there? So there's natural threats, human threats, and environmental threats. Okay, and you know, you, it, it, this is from this, you ask questions, who's the adversary? But you know what? I mean, that's starting to become a bit academic. You don't really care. You know that a, a threat could happen. It's going to be some individual group, organizational, uh, government, um, not our government, of course, but you know, some other people's government. Our government would never spy on us, but uh, nature or uh, you know anyone that has the intent to conduct detrimental activities against your uh, organization. Now, so again, here's the spreadsheet. What's the threat? Threat: theft of a laptop computer, theft of a desktop computer, theft of a smartphone. Uh, your primary facility going down, your backup facility going down. We give you lists so that you don't have. You're not staring at that blank sheet of paper. Now, I got to tell you that these are lists that are, that we put together that are non-technical in nature. To get the, at the technical vulnerabilities that exist in your operational environment, you have to have some network scanning software uh, that, you know, go out, that goes out and, and says, hey, is, you know, are these ports open? Are, are these OSs up to snuff at patch level, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at, ever look at one of those reports, even for a small network, you could have thousands of vulnerabilities. But you need to identify those. But don't forget that you have these other vulnerabilities that have nothing to do with technology that you also need to capture. Okay, so the vulnerability is, um, hey, you know, descriptions. The desktops are not physically locked. Um, there's no encryption. Uh, you know, we have we mobile phones aren't identified. We can't do remote wipes. I mean, et cetera, et cetera. The, the number of vulnerabilities are, um, even for a small environment, will probably go into the thousands easily. Uh, so step three is, right, you've done step one, which was an inventory. You've done step two, which is identify the vulnerabilities, and that, that's a two-part step, right? It's, it's, it's an organizational and the stuff that you can identify without technology, and then the stuff that technology will help you identify. Uh, and then you're going to look at, okay, so what's working? What's the, what's the as-is environment right now? What's working, and what do we have in place? So the security roles can be both technical and non-technical. So the technical controls include but aren't limited to parts of information systems such as hardware and software and various uh, mechanisms within the hardware and software to help you meet the rules, automatic log offs, strong passwords, the ability to produce audit logs that reflect who's access PHI, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. So you're, you're looking at, in step three, you're looking at the as is so that you can take what's already working and apply it to what's changed. So what uh, what are some technical controls, access controls, identification methods, authentication methods, encryption methods, automatic log off, other autom audit controls? Th those are the kind of technical controls that you would be documenting uh, in your as is. But there's also non technical controls. So these are management and operational controls, policies, procedures, standard guidelines. These are also vulnerabilities. If you haven't trained your workforce, how can you expect to? Uh, how can you expect them to understand what they should be doing? And if you haven't trained them, how on earth are you going to be able to justify a sanction policy that you sanction them for violating a policy that they don't even know exists? You know, just from a pure employment law perspective, you're not going to get very far if that's how you go about doing it, right? So these are kinds of controls that you don't need technology to implement, and yet 
you got to have them in place or otherwise you're going to get dinged. And actually, most of the breaches uh, occur because of some sort of human error. Right? Somebody takes a laptop and they lose it or gets stolen or a phone, etc. By far, by far, and here's where you can really get loose track of the forest for the trees, you start focusing on you know, trying to keep the hackers out and yet you're losing laptops with, that have hundreds of thousands of records on them. And, un, and then they're unencrypted, and that's that's a human problem, not a technology problem. And by far, heretofore, the breaches that have occurred have been human errors. I mean, David, would you agree with that? That's right. I mean, it's it's the it's the lost laptop or hard drive. It's the uh, it's the uh, person who's who doesn't know what he's doing when he's trying to uh, delete records uh, and instead publishes them. Um, so yeah, it's it's a human factor. So, so you know, so it's important to pay attention to all of it, but definitely you don't want to lose track of it. the human factors are really critical to your potential liability. Now, you know, physical controls, redundant power supply, redundant internet connections, uh, car key access to server rooms, things like that, uh, would be the types of physical controls. And this is all step three, which is document your as-is environment. Um, so capture security controls already in place at the information system or other computing infrastructure level, and we're using infrastructure information system really broad, devices, network, communications, applications, etc. And use the information gathered in step one. Use your inventory that you've gathered and say, these are the security controls that we have in place for these assets, for these operations. These are the things we have in place. So that's how you can use the tools to begin to capture what your current environment uh, looks like. Step four is you're really asking the question whether the threat will materialize. And I'm going to go through these fairly quick uh, because you guys can read the slides and we can have another 10 uh, minutes or so for additional questions. So determine the probability P that a specific threat will exploit a particular vulnerability and that's going to look something like this. Okay. So you have threat vulnerability pairs. Now a particular threat T can exploit more than one vulnerability, but when you're looking at calculating risk, you're looking at threat vulnerability pairs. So in this example, you would be looking at threat two, vulnerability one, what's the probability that that threat will, in, will exploit that vulnerability? That would be P, okay? Probability high, medium, or low. So step five is, what's the impact? What I, what's the impact that an exploitation will have on your operational environment? What's the magnitude of harm that is likely to result if that vulnerability is exploited? And again, it's high, medium, or low that you would give a ranking to, and that's the I. All right, so we're doing a calculation, so we're not really doing math. And the same thing for risk. Risk, then, is a specific risk level, R, is calculated as a function of the probability of a threat exploiting a specific vulnerability and the impact that that exploitation is likely to have on your operation. Now, when you first look at this and you look at the, um, you know, the NIST documentation, you're kind of pulling your hair out because of all the, uh, you know, the vocabulary and, and, and these concepts that don't really seem to uh, have any clarity to it until you realize, really, you're just talking about a purely subjective analysis that, uh, that you'll get better and better at doing over time. So remember that any given threat is capable of exploiting one or more vulnerabilities and therefore capable of generating more than one uh, risk calculation. So the risk, again, high, medium, or low, and you're documenting these things as you go. Okay? And I got to tell you that you know, this is why you don't understand the problems until you start doing it. You're, you will be overwhelmed, and you're going to have to make these calls as to what we're going to remediate now versus what we're going to leave. And again, remember, perfection, perfection is not the objective. In fact, perfection is unachievable. You can't even look at the problem that way. You know, you have to make a good faith effort for an organization of your size, resources, or et cetera, so that you can make a, a, a an argument that you what you did was reasonable and appropriate. So that's how you go about calculating risk. And step seven of risk assessment really is document the new security controls that you're going to implement this cycle to mitigate the risk that you've identified that you have to go after to reduce risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. Um, and here we have some um, 
security controls that are applied to other parts of the security rule, rule that, as a reminder, don't forget these. They're not technical in nature, but they're important. <clears throat> so here are the steps. You guys can read those. We're going to um, talk about time, and we talked about that. You've got to have one, right, or you're definitely going to get dinged. You've got to have one. Remember, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just You have to have a good faith effort if you're going to attest to meaningful use. Anytime there's a major change, we talked about that, and when it's warranted by applicable law. All right, stage one meaningful use at this at that station. You have to have a risk assessment, or you can't uh, attest. The responsible parties: you, your compliance officer, your executive team, essentially the entire organization. We have some products and services that we offer in this space, uh, specifically uh, a subscription plan that includes all our products and services, which are checklists, frameworks, and the tools and spreadsheets that we just uh, looked at. Um, our uh, objective here is to provide the recipe, the how-to, the step-by-step -step guidance, not just the ingredients. Uh, we believe we have some products that really you can start executing on day one. That's um, that's our objective, our goal. And you can click on any one of these covers and go take a look inside what these products actually contain. So that's um, going to leave you with these policies plus processes plus, plus tracking mechanisms is what gives you visible demonstrable evidence of compliance and eventually will get you to a culture of compliance. At this point, we'll take some more questions. Uh, we don't have but one question. Where can I print the slides from the webinar? Um, the, sli the slides were, uh, we distributed the slides to everyone uh, prior to the webinar unless you, unless you registered today, in which case Case, you will have to uh, email us to get a copy of the slides. Now, you so the, they were distributed. They were sent to your mailbox. Check your spam folder and your junk mail folder to make sure that they're uh, they're not in there. And they were sent to you as a PDF, so you can just get the PDF and print out the PDF. That's the only question we have at this time. Okay. Well, we're. Um, right about the time that we've allotted. Um, David, do you have any closing comments? I just want to say that I've, um, I've been looking at and using some of the tools that you just identified, and um, they are uh, very usable and user-friendly, and uh, you know, you're able to hit the ground running by picking up uh, one of those tools. Uh, Great. I, interruption uh, just for a second. Yes. Uh, would you please speak briefly about the omnibus rule. That's a, that's a half hour to 45 minutes for each of you. Well, here's the thing. The omnibus rule, first of all, the omnibus rule didn't revolutionize uh, anything. What it did was it high-techized the privacy rule, the security rule, the breach notification rule, and the enforcement rule, right? It made modifications to those four rules, but it really it was the High Tech Act that drove all those changes, right? So don't mistake the omnibus rule as the change, change agent. The omnibus rule was a, a regulatory uh, exercise by a OCR HHS to respond to uh, the omnibus rule. Now, if your question goes to you need to be making sure that any product or you know that, that that you buy that with templates and all that is omnibus rule ready and and so we had to go through and update all our training all our checklists everything with respect to the omnibus rule because it turned out to a larger or lesser degree it touched just about everything okay uh, now uh, I think we'll be happy to speak more specifically if the if the questioner had a yeah. A, a more narrow question. I mean, it addressed it, it. It made more changes, I would say, on the security side than on the privacy side. And what uh, Carlos has been talking about today, in terms of the risk assessment that has to be done and the standards and concerns that need to be kept in mind, these are these already incorporate the omnibus rule changes. Correct. But as Carlos said, also you need to be sure if you're using tools that are that are being advertised as uh, uh, HIPAA ready, uh, they need to be omnibus rule ready as well. Exactly, exactly. Any, any um, follow up, Martin? Uh, just a little follow up for you guys. Uh, kudos, uh, excellent discussion, very informative. Um, so I, 
I guess you guys did a good job. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, a little housekeeping. Next month's um, webinar, and I, I hope, um, uh, by the way, David's got an open invitation, so I hope he can join me on as many as he can fit into his schedule. But we're, gonna, we're talking about how you launch a comprehensive HIPAA compliance program. It's also what this month's uh, newsletter is about. Uh, and, and I think you're going to find some things that are eye-opening in that webinar uh, for you to consider so that you're not uh, buying a point solution and thinking that you're getting a comprehensive solution that will help you with the entirety of your program. So we're going to actually define what a comprehensive solution uh, would look like in next month's webinar. So uh, stay tuned, uh, plug into our newsletter and into the LinkedIn group if you want to the Survivor Guy LinkedIn group if you want to follow the conversation. I just want to thank David for attending. He added, as I thought he would, a tremendous amount of value, and thanks you guys for uh, participating. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, everybody.